On the breakfast, a socioeconomic rights and accountability project is urging the chairman of the independent National Electoral Commission to seek to appoint an independent council to investigate allegations of electoral offences by state governors during the just concluded general election. How feasible is this? We have analysis ahead. Also on the breakfast, three weeks after the Central Bank of Nigeria directed banks to comply with the decision of the Supreme Court on the old Nara note, has the cash crunch eased? Now, some reports suggest so. We'll discuss this later on the program. And of course, I will take a peek of the headlines on the front pages of today's national dailies in of the press. And we are back. Uh, it's the breakfast on Plus TV Africa. A beautiful Monday uh, morning reaching you live from uh, Africa's uh, most popular city, Lagos. And of course, uh, the Nerve Center, commercial Nerve Center of Nigeria. My name is Kofi Bartels. And I am Messi Boho. It's good to have you join us this morning on uh, the breakfast. As always, we'll start off our conversation with a top trending coffee. Yes, indeed. But before then, Messi, the weekend was quite interesting. Um, and of course, I can see some people are smiling a bit more. And I asked them, why are you smiling a bit more? They didn't tell me, but you know, when they said, oh, uh, I saw the smiles on the face, I see must have had some, some Naira. <laughs> <laughs> you know. So we'll look at that ahead on the program. But our first top trending story for today has to do with... Uh, um, the ANSARS period. This goes all the way back to ANSARS where um, a particular driver, he's a driver of a cab, a taxi service, one of the new um, taxi healing apps. Uh, he became a victim, what we call a collateral damage, when of course uh, he was abused by uh, police officers during the anniversary of that ANSARS project, uh, or protest rather. Well, um, the man went to court, he gave, um, he instituted a, a fundamental rights enforcement suit and uh, he got a compensation of 5 million naira. Initially, we had the government of Lagos State um, through those at the Justice Ministry saying that, that they may appeal this uh, judgment or ruling by, order rather, by the court, um, uh, awarding a 5 million naira compensation to uh, this individual. And some hours later, uh, we saw that uh, the, uh, uh, the governor of Lagos State put a tweet out, you know, addressing Lagosians and saying that he uh, would approve, you know, the payment of this uh, five billion naira compensation to this um, uh, uh, ride-hailing app taxi driver, let's call it that, uh, who was uh, abused by or tortured by police officers on the anniversary of the ANSAS protest, uh, October 20, 2021. Okay, that's the 21st of October, uh, 2021. His name is Adedo Tun Clement, and um, uh, congratulations to him. According to reports, he was carrying a passenger to, you know, Lagos mainland uh, when he encountered a gridlock at the Lekki Tollgate during the protest for that ANSAR's anniversary. And uh, he was grabbed, because, of course, the court has ruled in his favor, so he said allegedly, I don't know, but he was grabbed and uh, pepper sprayed, pepper sprayed by officers of the Lagos State neighborhood safety agency and policemen and of course uh, this was all over the internet or you know, twitter and all that so congratulations to him uh, in ebay F. Young is a human rights lawyer who represented him or instituted uh, that fundamental rights enforcement uh, case in court that lawsuit against the uh, nigeria police force and the legal state government on behalf of the victim because if you look at the labels legal state uh, neighborhood safety watch officials they are employees of the state government so that's that uh, five million naira damages. Lagos State government saying they will appeal, and now the governor put out a tweet saying that um, yeah, he will uh, he will pay that money. He approved the payment. This is just what he said in Twitter. Permit me to quote that. Uh, it says, "Good evening, Lagos. As governor, I am committed to upholding uh, the rule of law and protecting citizens' rights with empathy and authority." I recently became aware of the case involving Mr. Clement at Dedotu and the judgment by the Federal High Court, and I understand the impact this legal battle has had on him. He went on to say, uh, after reviewing Mr. Clement's case, I've directed the Honorable Attorney General to set up a meeting 
and pay him uh, the compensation uh, awarded by the courts, uh, except of what the governor had to say? Well, um, I mean, if you look at it, uh, the clause right there would be the rule of law. I'm sure if it was uh, comprehension, maybe it was part of you know English language uh, for an examination, you want to underline uh, most important facts right there. The rule of law, just like the uh, governor has stated, uh, should be upheld, and that's what it is. But, you know, over time, we seem to be in a climb where those who should understand and those who should, should show example or lead by example are doing differently and upholding and respecting court judgment. It hasn't been very common with us. It's not, you know, very common practice. It is expected, and that's why I'm not surprised when I see uh, a lot of commendation, including the lawyer himself, commending the governor, uh, Babaji De Songwulu, for saying he will uphold the rule of law and he would respect that. Well, you know, he's wanting to make that statement, which can just be a statement, but it's another thing to comply and do the need for, but it will go a long way. The rule of law, it's the rule of law, and it's very important for our democracy. If we say we practice you know, a democratic system of governance, then the rule of law is one of, uh, you know, one element that's very important. And it's just simple that the law is the same. It's there's a uniformity, you know, it's not different. Everyone in the society must obey it. And so over time, uh, we've had situations where the rule of law has not been upheld, especially when you have court rulings and judgment. How many times do you have compliance, especially from the elites, the ruling class, including the president, including the governors and what have you? Uh, so the question will continue. And I'm not surprised why people are commending or some persons are saying, hey, it's very commendable of the legal state governor or government to say we're going to comply with this order and we'll make the payment, the compensation for the Uber driver, five million naira. And uh, it will go a long way also in helping our judiciary. You understand the fact that a lot of Nigerians have lost trust in the judicial system because of, you know, the fact that we have over time contributed to this. When I say we, if, if you have a court ruling, this is a ruling, you should obey it. And for every other time, we do not pay attention to whatever the court says. We just continue to discredit the judicial system of government and, you know, make the people... Uh, not believe in the system entirely. So yes, it is commendable. But should we celebrate it? It's just what is expected. That if you have a ruling, it's expected that you obey the court, whether it is the highest court of the law or it's not the highest court of the law. But it is a ruling and uh, it's also part of helping our democracy move forward. So yes, we say it is commendable. But it's also one thing, like I rightly stated, to say, hey, we have... We're going to comply with it, but we want to see compliance. Compliance will mean you're going to pay the sum of $5 million just as the court has stated. Well, uh, very interesting that the Lagos state government, uh, um, uh, you know, came out to say on, in the aftermath of this uh, that they were going to appeal uh, the, the order of court or the judgment of the, of the court, at, uh, the high court. You know, uh, and um, for me, when I saw that, because I've been in a similar uh, situation, um, uh, I was taken aback. You know, I saw a headline that I had to click on on that day, and I just went there. It says Lagos rejects order for compensation of driver assaulted at Ansas Memorial. You know, and I said to myself, well, it's just one person. You know, it's just one person. Um, uh, why reject it? It's just five million naira. Mercy for such um, such uh, acts of brutality. You know, five million naira doesn't cut it, Mercy, at all. You know, I, I had my own situation where I had to go to court. You know, to enforce my fundamental rights. Um, after I was I was brutalized by SARS officials, believe it or not, before answers. You know, so whilst the answers panel thing was going on, I'd already filed something in the courts. So I wasn't a part of that. But Mercy, the, the, the pains of that encounter with the SARS officials, I don't want to go into what happened. I, I will meet till today, you know. And um, the judge, in, her, in his wisdom, let me say his, because I think all the judges are he, you know, the judge in his wisdom. And I, I have no, I can't question the wisdom of the judge. You know, I awarded, I awarded a compensation of five million naira. Um, and uh, for me, it wasn't about the money. 
you know but sometimes i'll look at it and say yeah uh if it's for for what i suffered i think it's not enough you know so this five millionaire for this man who was pepper spray who knows the injuries that live with him for the rest of his life okay but i'll take years to go away who knows the tra psychological trauma that he will face you know each time he has to remember this thing who knows what he lost as far as his business is concerned and um, whilst he was treating himself you know and all those things so when i when i when i see this amount of money five million naira uh, isn't even cutting one tenth of what he should get okay um some people are just uh, defamed and they award them 100 million naira so when i saw five million naira uh, and i saw that the legal state government said they were not going to uh, obey the order and they were going to actually appeal uh i was taken aback I was like, this is just, it doesn't even cut it. The amount doesn't cut it. So it's good to see, very, very commendable that uh, His Excellency, the governor of uh, Lagos State, has come out to say, we will pay the money. You know, mm -hmm. and he put it in a very nice way. So I think that's uh, very commendable. Very. Well, we're just lucky you have stated. Uh, we, we just move away from that for the want of time and look at another issue on the top trending is the fact that uh, a general... Ola I mean, this is the case. It's, it's not very exciting. Usually when you have uh, someone pass, no matter what it is, it's, you know, it's not an exciting one you know, to lose a life. But, you know, a very highly pleased uh, military personnel has passed on General Ola Dia, former chief of general staff under the late head of state, General Sania Bachar, is dead. Now, his death was announced in a statement by his son, Prince Dia, uh, on Sunday morning. And uh, it's important to note, there's a lot to say about him. I mean, there's a lot of controversy. I saw reactions from Nigerians saying, you need to see how he was begging for his life at the time. But uh, Dia was born on April the 3rd. Apparently, he would have been how many years old? April the 3rd, uh, 2023. Uh, but that's not the case. He was born April the 3rd, 1944, in Ogun State, uh, former chief of general staff who joined the Nigerian Defense Academy, Kaduna, and fought during the Nigerian Civil War. Uh, Dia was appointed chief of general staff in the Army in 1993. You want to ask yourself where you were and how old you were in 1993. And he was also the vice chairman of the Provisional Ruling Council in 1994. That was also another great time. He was second in command and de facto vice president of Nigeria under uh, Abacha, of course, uh, from 1994 as a chief of general staff. He also lost his wife, Falasha Day, in 2020. That would have been a lot. But uh, following, you know, the circumstances to before his death, a lot of people think that he's been silent at the time when he came out from prison. But, you know, I just allow the floor. So just say the floor. What is the floor at the table? You know, on the microphone, took a feet. Yeah, uh, I don't see no, no <laughs> microphone. <laughs> Where is the mic? Give it to me. Yeah. Um, but um, I, I think it's... Uh, we, we have a throwback video uh, of when uh, uh, the deputy uh, general, rather, uh, who was a deputy to Abacha, uh, General Ladipodia was arrested by the then head of state, General Sani Abacha, um, and uh, the allegation was, of course, for the coup or attempted coup in 1997. Uh, he was convicted, of course, for treason and sentenced to death in April 1998. Let's just take a flashback. Uh, this is courtesy of the Nigeria Television Authority. Visions of Section 1 of the Treason and Treasonable Offences Decree Number 29 of 1993, the Special Military Tribunal for the Trial of Persons Involved in the December 1997 Coup Plot, has sentenced to death persons found guilty of treason and any treasonable offence. Announcing the verdict today, at the end of its sittings, Chairman of the Tribunal, Major General Victor Malu, said that 15 persons out of a total of 30 tried were found guilty as charged. 14 were found not guilty, while one was convicted for a lesser offense than the original charge. Lieutenant General Oladik Bodia is amongst the 13 persons charged for treason and conspiracy to commit treason. 
He was found guilty on both counts. Lieutenant General DOD charge one treason, finding guilty. Charge two conspiracy to commit treason, finding guilty. Major General A.T. Olariwazi, charge one treason, finding guilty. Charge two conspiracy to commit treason, finding guilty. Major General A.K. Adisa, charge one treason, guilty. Charge two conspiracy to commit treason, finding guilty. Lieutenant Colonel O. Akiode, charge one treason, finding not guilty. Charge two, conspiracy to commit treason, finding guilty. All right. Um, these are the days that uh, some people are asking us to go back to. <laughs> these are the days of military era. <laughs> you know what they call those? Kangaroo court. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, kangaroo court. Um, so so uh, right there you can see that um, the general was stood there like an ordinary um, you know, civilian, someone you can just meet or pick up from the streets, just dressed ordinarily. And that's what the military can do to you. If you do anyhow, you see anyhow. I mean, I think if it was in the civilian area where he has to go to court, he probably would be dressed, you know, and, you know, go with a lot of, uh, uh, you know, elegance. But, um, uh, Mercy, you mentioned the fact that uh, General Oladipodia, uh, you know, was a bit of a, a quiet life of sorts. Um, I, I would say so, you know, in recent, in latter years of his life. But he wasn't too quiet because he gave several interviews. You know, I remember even uh, in my days in university up until, you know, some years ago, regularly reading about him and his, uh, he was a constant fixture in the newspapers, really. Um, but what I can say was that um, uh, General Dia, uh, who's a, a former chief of general staff, uh, who himself also was a lawyer, I think he led the life of an elder statesman. You know, someone who said after getting uh, another chance at life, you know, another chance of life because, you know, treason has its own um, uh, penalty. Um, he, he led a quiet life, okay? Um, he gave me a regular me media interviews, but never really seriously from uh, that point uh, actively interfered with things, you know? Um, so I think he's um, an example, all right? An example to be emulated, an example to follow, I think the other person who has also just led um, uh, a statesman-like life is uh, Yakubu Gowan, former head of state as well, you know, who's led a statesman-like life. Uh, you have the likes of uh, um, Atiko Bokar, who was not a military man, but he was in the customs. And in that, that frame, uh, you have the likes of um, General Buhari, uh, Olusha Gobasanjo, who've still been in the free, you know, as military men, uh, retired military men. So I think he deserves... Um, a lot of commendation. I think that uh, he's worth emulating. He's worth emulating. Uh, he was a consummate general. Um, somebody who wasn't just a, a, a soldier, but also had, you know, his stint in administration. Someone who was a qualified lawyer, and and all that. Played a lot of roles, um, including being the GOC of 82 Division, uh, Enugu, uh, member of the Armed Forces Ruling Council, the defunct AFRC. Um, the debacle over the annulment of the June 12, 1993 presidential uh, election uh, forced Babangida to step aside then and hand over to the interim national government of election at the time. And of course, Sulita, uh, in court, resigned from office and handed over to uh, General Sani Abacha with Dia, then becoming the chief of general staff and de facto second in command to the new leader. So, um, he cut his teeth in governance and public administration as uh, the military governor of his state of origin. Uh, indeed, the incumbent governor of his state, um, uh, Ogun State, has, uh, you know, he's been among those who have been eulogizing the late uh, General Oladipo Dia. So, may he so rest in peace. He's left his, his mark on the sands of time. And um, he has been a consummate uh, elder statesman, if you want to call it that. Uh, General Oladipo Dia. You came, you saw, and you conquered. Rest in peace. Definitely. Uh, she should rest in peace. And more of a lesson would be that every mortal would definitely go. What's important is how you, I mean, what mark you would leave uh, when you're gone. What would people say about you? Just like we're speaking about 
the general noun Oladipo or dia. Okay, so think about it. It's it's what you do while you're on earth, because every mortal will definitely go. Yes, indeed, every mortal will definitely go. Where we'll just take a, a moment of silence for the gentleman. All right, so once again, we say may his soul rest in peace. Uh, uh, amen. Yeah. Okay, uh, Mercy, when was the last time you heard about uh, Nigeria Airways or you saw a Nigeria Airways uh, uh, <laughs> aircraft? If you ask me the last time I heard about the Nigerian Airways, I probably <laughs> would say that we have had that in the news. I'm probably sure we'll probably have taken that because mm. uh, the government has said there will be you know, in operation before May 29th yeah. or on May uh, the 29th. I that I is for 2023. Yes, so that's yes. the last time. Uh, but seeing yeah. it, I haven't seen it. But I, I, have I, tell you, I tell you, I've been looking forward to this Nigeria Air because of, I was a fan of the Nigeria Airways back in the day. And um, some of the, uh, the, the, um, uh, the items, the branded items we had, you know, growing up. Um, so, I mean, it was, it was um, very welcome news, a surprise to many when the Minister of Aviation had his secret heart at the time hinted that, uh, you know, Nigeria, Nigeria Air will come on board. And then we saw the logos and we saw the, um, uh, you know, the launching of this uh, airline. Uh, however, we've had one or two twists and turns. We had about Ethiopian Airways being involved and all that, being interested uh, in, in, in starting the airline and running it. Um, so Nigerians have wondered, what is going on? Um, is this one of those other um, uh, gaps by the government where they say they're going to do something and they don't end up doing it? Well, Nigeria's aviation minister, Hadi Sirka, uh, he has hinted that the uh, controversial Nigeria Air, which will be the national carrier of the country, which people have, you know, uh, said is just on paper and is one of the failed promises of the administration of uh, President Mohamed Buhari. And he has said that uh, this airline will commence operation before the swearing in of the new administration uh, on the 29th of May. Um, and of course, uh, the minister disclosed this at the ongoing National Aviation Stakeholders Forum 2023 in Abuja on Thursday. Um, and this is what he said, and I quote, operation and of local and international flights will commence soon before the end of this administration, before May 29, we will fly. So the Ethiopian airline interest has developed and gone beyond the point of interest or expression of interest. They've actually been working. Uh, they've been working behind the scenes to ensure uh, that this becomes a reality. And the work they've been doing includes negotiations. What the minister said at that forum was that uh, uh, negotiation meetings with the Ethiopian Airlines Group uh, and the federal government uh, are still ongoing. And the next step they're saying is that the Federal Executive Council, uh, which is the, um, the cabinet of Nigeria, uh, will approve the full business case. All right, so that's that. And it's, I think, it's a welcome development for people who have been hoping to see something something like this. So we'll be waiting for the Federal Executive Council to do the needful, uh, approve the full business case, and then we see uh, everything moving quickly to have Nigeria air in the sky. Well, you know, uh, some consent that should come to Nigerians and a lot of people uh, should be wary about because it's, it's not every other time you hear the government say we'll do X, Y, Z and then they live up to expectation. Don't forget there's also been, you know, uh, court, I mean, litigations. And then the government is saying they're trying to see how they can uh, overcome these hurdles to ensure that, you know, this happens. So we want to for for once in a lifetime, uh, you know, take the Nigerian government by her words and say that on May 29, uh, this will commence because we are words. here, we have yes. marked it, you know, it's here. Go back to play this tape and look at it. Agreement is agreement. What you say is what you have said. <laughs> I know if you go into that, you're going to be singing, but how, how can these things become? Another also, if you look at highlights of this, uh, you also remember that, uh, uh, you know, the Ethiopian airline also, they're asking for a lot, moratorium. Uh, they're also asking for, uh, there's several things that they're asking for. Uh, 15 years of, you know, no tax payment and what have you. Uh, too many other issues, the tax issues. Uh, we also know the issues where you have pilots who are not employed. There might, this might also be some sort of 
uh, you know, on opportunities to employ. But uh, let's see how all of this pans out. Mm. May 29th yes, yes, <laughs> is the date. Absolutely. Um, you know, many Nigerians had uh, criticized the Buhari administration uh, for um, trying to start a new national career, you know, after Nigeria Airways, of course, we know what happened, corruption and all that. Um, we have less than two months in office for the Buhari administration. I don't know what they can do in that those two months, uh, but they have um, a window of opportunity to impress Nigerians and to really leave a legacy, you know. Um, the new national career, we're told, will be owned partly by uh, the government of Nigeria and also will be man man uh, managed rather by a private partner. Um, some local airlines went to court, you know, they sued the federal government, of course, asking the court to stop the new national career as it will get unfair advantages over uh, other airlines in the country. Of course, you know what government can do. Um, so, in November last year, if you remember, the uh, Federal High Court in Lagos issued an interim injunction or an order of interim injunction um, restraining the Nigerian government from proceeding with the establishment of this new national carrier. Um, Mr. Sika was asked this in February, the papers carried it that he said he was not aware of any court injunction, you know, to that, that effect. So um, I think that is the case, you know, maybe he's still saying he's not aware. Probably they've had discussions behind the scenes to try and, uh, you know, you know, work on these guys so that they don't, uh, they don't um, interfere with what's going on. So let's see what happens. There's a lot to talk about this uh, uh, story. Now, last thing I would say is the pension for May 29. We've seen the governor of Lagos State saying that uh, they'll complete the red, li red rail or red line before May 29. Now we're hearing the Minister of Aviation say they'll complete this uh, Nigeria Air business for May 29. We're asking them, we're begging them, please. You, there's nothing about May 29 that you must, you must meet, okay? If you can't do by May 29, don't rush. Because they don't want to see government projects being rushed just to meet up in May 29 and then... They're not being done properly. Okay. This, this is an airline. People are going to fly. It must be safe. The red, red line that the governor is talking about, people will also use it. It must be safe. So if you don't think you can do it by May 29, don't well, rush. We need to don't move rush. on. That's, that's uh, what I'm saying. Yes, we, we need to yeah, go we, away. We uh, the go conversation away. can never end. I'm sure that if we want to continue, there will be you know too many issues to talk about. But we take a break now. When we return, it will be time for us to go through the papers. We'll call it Off the Press. Please stay with us. Good morning.